Dr. Jabir, please get started. Uh, folks, uh, I'm glad to be speaking to you again in an opening presentation. Now on the topic, uh, is Jesus a prophet of Islam? I would obviously say yes, and uh, that leads me to explain. Uh, is he a prophet, and uh, does he teach uh, Muslim uh, doctrines? Uh, first of all, it is very clear, not only in the Quran, but also in the Bible, that Jesus is a prophet. In fact, this is the one thing that is uh, uh, known uh, from his own uh, teachings consistently and repeatedly, even in the earliest uh, sources. Uh, and in fact, even in the later developed teaching in the Gospel according to John, for example, we have Jesus identifying himself as a prophet, which is very interesting because uh, John uh, wants to tell us that Jesus is the uh, word of God from all eternity, that he was there for right from the very beginning. And uh, in some sense, Christians would take that to mean that Jesus is God himself. But notice that he cannot be God himself and also God's prophet at the same time, because a prophet by definition uh, from the Greek prophet is, is uh, one who speaks on behalf of another. Uh, so a prophet of God is one who speaks on behalf of God. It's not God himself coming to speak. God does not become his own prophet. Somebody else speaks on his, his behalf, that somebody else is the prophet. So if Jesus is speaking on behalf of God, he's not God, and he's not ontologically the son of God. He is a servant and messenger of God, designated by God to go and preach his uh, message. Uh, so did he teach uh, Muslim doctrines? The, mo the most uh, important doctrine in Islam is the belief that there is only one God, and uh, by extension that Jesus is the, a servant and messenger of this one God. And in fact, this uh, uh, teaching is uh, found in the, in the Bible as well. Uh, in fact, when we look at uh, passages which Christians often uh, introduce to show that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, as we saw in the previous debate, either that passage could mean that uh, Jesus is claiming to be a Son of God as meaning a beloved person to God, one who is approved by God, and not necessarily God himself or, or ontologically Son of God, uh, or that could be a passage which is introduced by somebody else uh, trying to make Jesus look like more than just simply a, a beloved uh, person to God, that he's ontologically uh, son of God. But uh, when we look at the doctrines carefully, we see that in fact, uh, Jesus on whom be peace was teaching monotheism. He himself was praying to God. Uh, in the Gospel according to Matthew in chapter 26, verse number 39, he fell on his face and prayed. So uh, he's, he was praying in the manner in which Muslims pray, by falling on our faces, we pray to God. And if he was praying to God, then, th then it is clear that he himself is not the God to whom he is praying. He demonstrated himself to be a servant, a messenger, and a worshiper uh, of the Almighty God. So he taught monotheism. So how did that monotheism get lost? Uh, and is it possible for Christians to retrace their steps and find it again? I would say it got lost through the writing and rewriting of the story of Jesus. When we go from Mark to Matthew and Luke, we see how the story has been rewritten, starting with Mark, which uh, uh, David has agreed is the earliest uh, of the four Gospels. Uh, then we go to Matthew and Luke, and we see that the story has changed. The, the same incident being reported differently. For example, when Jesus in the Gospel according to Mark was asked about the greatest of all his commandments, he correctly uh, reported uh, that the greatest commandment is what we know from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, uh, and then it follows up with, love your God, the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. But then when we go to Matthew's rendition of the same incident, and Jesus has asked the same question, but now he does not give the Shema Yisrael from, from the book of Deuteronomy. He just skips that part about, about the monotheism, and uh, he goes right into love your God. And this, of course, is what uh, our Christian friends uh, remember. Just love God and everything will be okay. Now, we like the message of love, and that's good. And Muslims need to uh, incorporate more of that message of love. The Quran actually praises our Christian friends uh, for this message of love. Uh, it says that God has placed in the uh, be uh, believing Christians uh, in, their, in their hearts, mawaddatan wa rahma, love and uh, mercy. So Muslims need to uh, also copy that uh, good trait. We don't condemn the, what is good, and we accept what is good regardless of where it is uh, found. But the important uh, part of that statement about monotheism, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, is dropped by Matthew. And that shows that Matthew is heading in a different direction here, and he's heading towards Trinitarian doctrine. It's not Trinitarian yet. In Matthew, uh, towards the end, where 
where, where Jesus says, go and baptize uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, some will take that as an expression of Trinitarian doctrine. But in fact, uh, as Robert Gondry says in his commentary on Matthew's Gospel, it does not actually mean that. It does not mean that the three, has, the three of them have just one name. It means uh, go and baptize with fundamental reference to the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that the three are one. In fact, we don't have any passage in the New Testament uh, Gospels or any other writings in the New Testament saying that uh, the three, uh, Father, Son, and, and Holy Ghost, together are one uh, God. Uh, quite to the contrary, we find that again and again, Jesus' uh, original teachings point to the fact that he is a monotheist and he's a servant of God. In Mark's gospel, when he was uh, approached and asked, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, if we go to Matthew's gospel and see that Matthew has actually transformed that episode so that the question is no longer starting with good teacher, it's only starting with teacher, and now the word good is, is uh, advanced to good deed. What good deed must I do? So Matthew has changed it so Jesus does not have to repudiate the title good. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel, he does not repudiate the title. He just uh, talks about uh, doing good deeds. So we have in Mark's gospel the repudiation of that title good. In Mark, Matthew's gospel, it is dropped. Uh, similarly, when Jesus uh, in Mark's gospel approached a fig tree, thinking that he will find uh, on it some fruit, and he didn't find any fruit because it was not the season for figs, it makes Jesus appear as a human being, not having the full knowledge of God and not knowing even that it was not the right season to expect figs from trees. Uh, but Matthew's gospel giving us the same uh, incident has so transformed the story that uh, it does not uh, reveal the ignorance uh, here of, of the person in question, and it leaves it open for us to give a moralizing uh, emph emphasis on this uh, story a and, and we no longer see that Jesus was a human being like other human beings not knowing uh, perhaps uh, from a distance whether a tree has uh, figs or not. So we see that the story about Jesus has actually been transformed from an original uh, monotheistic uh, doctrine where Jesus is a prophet and servant of God. He's teaching Islamic monotheism uh, and uh, by extension Jewish monotheism as well. And uh, later on, that teaching is uh, heading towards the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. We see a similar development when we come to think about the uh, possibility that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Uh, and the Gospel according to Mark, it was uh, uh, doubtful as to whether or not Jesus uh, died on the cross. Uh, because the Gospel according to Mark simply said that he expired, and when uh, Pilate was requested permission to take down the body of Jesus for burial, Pilate was amazed that Jesus could have died so soon. And uh, he was assured by the centurion, but by this time the centurion was already a believer in Jesus and had no reason to see Jesus dead. In fact, we have other uh, indications in the Gospels that even Pilate did not have enough interest in killing Jesus. He wanted Jesus to go free, but his arm was being twisted by the mobs who were saying, if you don't uh, deal with him, we'll report you to Caesar. And uh, even though his wife also did not want to, uh, Jesus to be killed, seeing, seeing uh, many di different dreams that would indicate that uh, Jesus should not be killed, eventually uh, so uh, things were flowing for the crucifixion of Jesus to take place. If Pilate could look the other way while Jesus was taken down from the cross alive, then why shouldn't he allow that? And in fact, it seems better to think that Jesus was taken down alive, put in the tomb, and uh, from the tomb he was raised up into heaven. In fact, uh, Reginald Fuller, in his uh, book on uh, uh, the development uh, of the story of the resurrection uh, actually shows that this was an early belief that many Christians uh, had. And uh, Daniel Smith in his book, The Postmortem Vindication of Jesus and the uh, Gospel uh, the Saints Gospel Q uh, shows that there are indications in that earlier gospel, the Q gospel, uh, that uh, Jesus did not actually die on the cross and perhaps he was taken down uh, and, and uh, that he was actually translated into heaven right from the tomb. So what do we have in, in the final analysis? In the final analysis we have it that uh, Jesus on whom be peace was a servant, a messenger of God, he was a prophet, and he was teaching uh, Islamic monotheism and uh, at the same time Jewish monotheism. And that he did not, uh, the, the proof that he rose from the dead uh, is not so very clear in the New Testament. And it seems that the Quran had an interesting insight by saying they had doubts uh, concerning uh, the incident. They thought they had killed him and crucified him. But in fact, they had not succeeded in their attempt. And Jesus was rescued and raised to heaven by God. Now finally, the Quran comes in as a revelation 
revelation from God to bring us back to the original monotheism of Jesus to tell us that Jesus was not son of God or God but he was a prophet of God, God's Messiah, God's servant and one teaching Muslim monotheism. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Shabir and uh, thank you for your opening uh, comments here, 10 minutes. Uh, we're resetting the clock here for David and you can start right now. Thank you Shabir. And, uh it is sad that Allah had to wait 600 years to correct all of that, uh, all of that misinformation. Uh, but let's look through this. In Mark 9.31, Jesus tells his followers, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. In Mark 10.45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Mark 2:28, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. In Matthew 22, 41 to 45, he claims to be the Lord of King David. In Matthew 25, 30, 31 to 46, Jesus tells his followers that he's the final judge who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Jesus says that he has a, an absolutely unique relationship with the Father, Matthew 11, 27, that he can answer prayers, John 14, 13 to 14, that he is present wherever his followers are gathered, that's Matthew 18, 20, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18, that he is with his followers forever, Matthew 28, 20, and that the entire universe is his personal property, John 16, 15. Doesn't sound like a very good Muslim prophet to me, but that's what we find when we examine the first century sources. So in order to preserve the Islamic view of Jesus, Muslims have no choice but to say that Jesus' message has been horribly corrupted. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm going to the text right here. The, the same text that I'm quoting are the texts that Shabir is quoting to show that Jesus was a good Muslim prophet. Those same texts say all of the things I just mentioned. Now, why, why believe some and not believe others? Well, it's because Islam is used to distinguish what's true from what's false in the Gospels. Uh, but there's a problem here. Muslims think that they have a higher view of Jesus, a theologically superior view of Jesus. I see things differently because a closer look at the Islamic view shows that it portrays God as incompetent and deceptive, and it, it portrays Jesus as the most stupendous failure in the history of the prophets. According to the Quran, Allah not only corrupted Jesus' message, but also helped Christians spread the false teachings. To understand why Islam demands this view, let us consider seven facts. Fact number one, the Quran states that Jesus was a messenger of Allah and a prophet of Islam. Surah 19, 23 to 33 tells us that Jesus began preaching Islamic theology as a baby. And Surah 42, verse 13 says that Jesus preached the same message as Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Muhammad. Fact number two, the Quran states that Jesus won a number of followers who are Muslims. So Jesus spent his life preaching Islam and, here's the key, he was successful. Surah 3, verse 52 and Surah 5, verse 111 say that his followers converted to Islam. So he had Muslim followers. Fact number three, in the Quran, Allah promises Jesus that his followers will be superior to the unbelievers until the day of resurrection. Notice that is a very long time and hasn't even, we haven't even reached that day yet. Allah doesn't say, sorry Jesus, but your disciples are going to be led astray by the Apostle Paul. Instead, Allah promises complete victory for Jesus' followers. Surah 3, verse 55. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take you and raise you to myself and clear you of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow you superior to, the, to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Again, since the day of resurrection hadn't arri hasn't arrived yet, Allah's promise is still in effect. Fact number four, if there were any first century Jews who converted to Islam at Jesus' preaching, they didn't last very long. We have a lot of historical information, a lot of, a lot of sources on Jesus' disciples, but we have no evidence at all that any of them believed anything remotely resembling Islam. Jesus' followers believed in his death for sins and his resurrection from the dead. They called him Lord and Son of God. We also know about people who rejected Jesus, people who accused him of blasphemy, but no Muslims. So if you want to believe that Jesus had Muslim followers, that's up to you. My point here is that if they did exist, they were so insignificant, we have no record that they even existed. Fact number five, according to Islam, Allah corrupted the gospel through the power of illusion, deceiving people into believing that Jesus died on the cross. History shows that Jesus' early followers became convinced that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. 
So the obvious reason there were no Muslim followers of Jesus after he ascended into heaven is that his followers came to believe he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Now, according to Islam, where did they get the idea that Jesus died on the cross? Where did they come up with that one? Surah 4, verse 157 and 158, we learn that Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus was crucified. Allah disguised one of Jesus' disciples, made him look like Jesus. Then this disciple was crucified, but Allah made everyone think that it was Jesus. So when my Muslim friends say that the gospel has been corrupted, we need to be clear that according to Islam, at least part of the gospel was corrupted by Allah himself. Fact number six, the Quran states that Allah helped spread Christianity. Once Allah had deceived countless people, thereby corrupting Jesus' message, he worked diligently to help Christians spread their corrupt gospel. Surah 61, verse 14, O you who believe, be helpers in the cause of Allah, as Jesus, son of Mary, said to his disciples, who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples said, we are helpers in the cause of Allah. So a party of the children of Israel believed, and another party disbelieved. Then we aided those who believed against their enemy, and they became uppermost. So Allah helped. He aided the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. Now, the only Christians who ever became uppermost over anyone were Christians who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, all of which are false doctrines according to Islam. So if these Christians became uppermost through the power of Allah, we can only conclude that Allah helped spread a corrupt version of Christianity instead of giving us the true version. Fact number seven, the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian scriptures. In Surah 5, verse 47, Allah says... Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Why would Allah tell us to judge by a corrupt book? If it's corrupt and we need to pick out the parts that agree with Islam, why not just tell us to believe the Quran? We have to start with the Quran and then go back to the gospel. Why not just go with the Quran? Why even go to this book that says Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead? In Surah 5, verse 68, Allah tells Muslims to say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. If the Quran is the only revelation that matters and everything else needs to be interpreted in light of it, why even tell us to stand upon the Torah and the gospel? What's the point of it? It no longer has a point. Surah 7, verse 157, Allah declares, Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. This assumes we still have the gospel. Allah says we have the gospel. Now, based on these facts, we have some questions for our Muslim friends. One, why would Allah corrupt Jesus' message and destroy everything Jesus had worked so hard to accomplish? Two, why did Allah tell Jesus that his followers would be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection? Didn't Allah know that he was about to corrupt Christianity by tricking people into believing that Jesus died on the cross? Three, if the gospel was given as a guidance to mankind, why didn't Allah preserve his message instead of introducing a heresy? Four, once the Christian heresy had started, why did Allah help the heretical Christians spread their heresy instead of just correcting them? Five, if the gospel was corrupted in the early centuries of Christianity, why did Allah say that Christians still possessed it during Muhammad's time? Six, if Allah deceives people who follow his prophets, how do Muslims know he's not deceiving them? Seven, since Jesus' message was corrupted by Allah and others, what did Jesus ultimately accomplish? What did Jesus do? What was the point of the virgin birth and the miracles? What was the point of Jesus being the Messiah? What was the point? What did Jesus accomplish? After all of that, after all of that, his followers are led astray. Allah, Allah helped corrupt the message. Then the apostle Paul came in and he helped corrupt the message. Everyone corrupts the message. And it was all pointless. Muslims will tell us, well, you know, he predicted the coming of Muhammad. Well, what's the point? What's the point of all of that? The, the, only, the only revelations we would have that would tell us that Muhammad is a prophet. The only scriptures Muslims would go to to try and show that Muhammad is a prophet and it's confirmed in our scriptures are the same sources that call Jesus the divine son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. The same scripture, scriptures that tell us to watch out for false prophets. These are the same scriptures. So what, this is one giant massive mess. And think about the implications. God does all this work, then corrupts it. Jesus 
spends his life preaching Islam, and he just fails miserably. He chooses followers to carry on that message. They just can't get the job done. And so Allah has to just put up with this for a long time, for 600 years until he fixes the mess. It, was Allah just unable to keep that message preserved? That's what I'm hearing from my Muslim friends, and that is what I find absolutely blasphemous. So uh, David's uh, presentation was very interesting. It uh, seems that uh, he was very well organized. He had his points uh, in his laptop. He can just read them off very rapidly. Um, and, and that was very interesting to see him do that. But in all of this, I find that there's a lack of, of critical thinking on the part of, uh, of David, though he's very critical of Islam. But when it comes to examining his sources and trying to find out for himself who Jesus was for Christians uh, of today, uh, he, 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 he doesn't have any critical thinking. For example, he is... Uh, clearly uh, agreed that the earliest uh, writings were not uh, the four Gospels that we have now in uh, our uh, Christian Bibles. Uh, and uh, yet he does not try to see uh, how to retrace the steps and find out who Jesus was before these Gospels were written. He does not try to follow my prompts and see uh, how Matthew and Luke changed the story from the way it was in Mark and how John changed the story even further. He continues to cite from these Gospels as though everything in all of these Gospels are absolutely true. And, and that shows an actual uh, absolute lack of critical thinking. For example, he cites a lot from Matthew's Gospel, from John's Gospel, to show that Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath or Lord of King David or final judge or uh, he answers prayer, for example, in, in John's Gospel or that he's with his followers uh, always in Matthew's Gospel. But where's the critical thinking? that says, let's go back, uh, uh, trace them over history. How did they go from Mark, uh, where Jesus was uh, obviously a human being, having limitations, uh, sometimes he didn't know uh, things, and how does that go from to, uh, to the extent that he's answering prayers in the gospel according to John? How does it go from simple son to uh, only begotten son? Uh, and what was there before Mark's gospel? Uh, how was the story changed from the way it was before to the way it comes to be entered in Mark? How was it before even Paul? Because Paul's writings that we have now uh, were written in the, uh, in the 50s uh, and early 60s. Uh, so, and Jesus was said to be crucified in the in, in year 30 or 33. So uh, Paul was writing some 20 years uh, after the fact. Uh, what went by during those 20 years? Uh, even the Gospel of Q was written 20 years after the fact by some anonymous person. So uh, it, uh, the Quran is actually taking us back to that original phase, and I've shown the development by case after case. Uh, there's not one or two instances, but this is a continuing story. We see the development uh, of Christian doctrine being reflected in the Gospels and being put back into the mouth of Jesus as if Jesus was teaching what Christians arrived at in the later decades of the first uh, century, especially as put now in the gospel according uh, to John. So we have to be critical and differentiate between wheat and chafe. David has to do this for his own sake because if he wants to be a true follower of Jesus, he has to discover the true Jesus as he was and as he walked on the earth, not as later gospel writers and, and preachers uh, represented him to be. So when we see, for example, that Luke says that he is depending on witnesses, uh, David actually did not quote uh, uh, fully what Luke said. Luke says not only the eyewitnesses, but also ministers of the word. So there were people who are eyewitnesses, and then there were people who preached the word. And, and Luke is relying on both. And we know how preachers uh, bend things in order to prove their own points when they're making them. And we don't know who were these eyewitnesses and who were these preachers of the word that Luke was de depending on. So all of this is much whole anonymous. We don't know who are the authorities and whether they were inspired men or not. And Luke himself does not claim to be uh, inspired. So we have to go back and look at these documents in a critical way. Now, was the uh, God deceptive? Uh, in, in quoting the verse from the Quran uh, that deals with the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, the, uh, David uh, mixed in the commentaries as though it is part of the verse itself. But the verse does not actually say that somebody else was made to look like Jesus and put on the cross instead. This is a common commentary. It is a very classical commentary. It is almost ubiquitous uh, in, in, the, in the ancient commentaries. However, uh, the, the verse itself does not need to mean all that. All that. Uh, the verse could simply mean that though the uh, enemies of Jesus thought that they had crucified him, they did not succeed in their uh, attempt to crucify him. It appeared as though they were succeeding, but they did not. And uh, God rescued Jesus and ra raised him to himself, but they were in doubt concerning the matter. And we see the doubt that is expressed 
expressed in the Gospels uh, themselves, and later Gospel writers trying to fix that doubt and convince us. The most convincing evidence is the one given in the Gospel according to John, again, the last of the four Gospels. So the story is developing, and the later Gospel writers are trying to fix the holes in the story. John tells us that Jesus was speared in the side, and if one wants to know what killed Jesus, one thinks, ah, oh, the spear thrust. But now we know that that's not historical. It is John's invention into the story, and the original story leaves a doubt that Jesus actually uh, died on the cross. God wasn't deceiving the disciples of Jesus. The Gospels themselves say that the disciples forsook Jesus and fled. And if they knew that uh, God, Jesus was not in God's protection, they would not have forsaken him and, and fled. Uh, the disciples of Jesus probably knew uh, that uh, Jesus uh, uh, was rescued and, by God and raised to heaven. The Quran actually in, in, in Surah 3 verse 54 uh, says uh, that uh, God raised Jesus to heaven and the commentary on that in, by Imam As-Suyuti show, shows that God actually showed uh, the disciples of Jesus a vision of Jesus uh, from heaven so that they can be solaced and be comforted and uh, they could know that God has actually raised Jesus. So in that case, it is not a Muslim belief that God de uh, deceived the disciples of Jesus. But the, the Jews, uh, the opponents of Jesus at the time, who wanted Jesus dead, uh, they themselves felt that they were being deceived. And uh, in fact, in that case, uh, the uh, tables were turned on them. They tried uh, by hook or crook to get Jesus crucified, but in fact, they did not succeed, and God actually raised his man uh, to heaven. So to say that God uh, was deceptive, uh, I, I don't think is, is correct. That's not the Muslim belief at all. Uh, moreover, when the Quran speaks about God uh, making the disciples of Jesus victorious, there are various statements which David has actually amalgamated together, but taking them one of the time, Surah 61, uh, verse, uh, 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 Surah 61's verse, does not uh, necessarily mean that all of the followers of Christianity uh, are, with all of their false doctrines, are approved by God. It's saying that the original disciples of Jesus, who were the Ansar Allah, uh, the helpers of God, they are made uh, victorious in a particular way. And then there could be another broader way in which uh, Christians in general, believing in Jesus, are made to be uh, more prevalent than to, uh, those who disbelieved in, in Jesus and rejected him and tried to get him crucified. So neither was God being deceptive, nor was he aiding the wrong crowd. He was aiding the monotheists uh, who, uh, with their faults, were monotheists at the time. Thank you, Dr. Shabir, and we're going to reset the clock uh, for David for seven minutes for his first, rebu second re first rebuttal, and we're getting ready for that clock, and we are ready to go in just a couple seconds, and you may start now. Thank you, Shabir. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opening now. statement, in my opening statement, I uh, drew attention to seven facts. Uh, the Quran states that Jesus was a messenger of Allah and a prophet of Islam. The Quran states that Jesus won a number of followers who were Muslims. In the Quran, Allah promises Jesus that his followers will be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection. Uh, if there were any first century Jews who converted to Islam due to Jesus' preaching, they didn't last very long. We have no record of their existence. According to Islam, Allah corrupted the gospel through the power of illusion, deceiving people into believing that Jesus died on the cross. The Quran states that Allah helped spread a corrupt version of Christianity, if, if, if he's the one helping the followers, then he's, he's helping spread their message. And the Quran states, uh, Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian scriptures. So let's look at uh, some of Shabir's responses. Uh, one, on the, uh, since the, the issue of the crucifixion is so crucial, um, I want to draw attention to an inconsistency in Shabir's method. If, if Shabir finds anything that any scholar has said that he can use to attack some Christian doctrine, uh, he'll use that. But if, if, if there's a consensus among scholars on some issue and it disagrees with Islam, it's as if the, the scholarship doesn't matter. So let's take an example, Jesus' death by crucifixion. We'll go through some non-Christian scholars, and those of you who follow, Christ, I mean, follow scholarship on early Christianity know who these guys are. Atheist New Testament scholar Gerrit Ludeman says that, that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Well, why should Beer disputing it? John Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Marcus Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, states that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. 
Jewish scholar Pincus Lapid concludes that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. Notice, they're not saying, yeah, we have, we have some reason to think it. Uh, they're certainly not saying, well, what probably happened is that Jesus survived and then uh, and was raised from the tomb. According to Paula Fredrickson, a convert to Judaism, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner, in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. And as everyone's favorite scholarly critic of Christianity, Bart Ehrman, maintains, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Notice, it's one of the most certain facts of history. It's indisputable. These are the things these scholars are saying with one un united voice. Why, why, why don't these scholars matter now? Why is it only when they're saying something critical, but when they're agreeing with some Christian uh, doctrine, uh, their position is meaningless? Now, Shabir says that I've mixed uh, Islamic commentaries with my view of the Quran. That's true, but it's, it's commentary that goes back to Muhammad and his companions on the, uh, I think, nine of the earliest ten uh, versions of what happened at the cross all involve substitution. There's one that just doesn't say. Uh, so this is, Shabir pointed out that this is, this is everywhere in Islam. And so if that's what, if, if that's the doctrine that became dominant in Islam, it, it seems that Shabir is doing something similar in Islam and Christianity. He's, saying, he's assuming that for, for, for decades, the people who are spreading the message just have no input and anyone could come in and just change whatever they want and that what actually gets down to us has nothing to do with the original message. Well, if, if Allah tells us something uh, in the Quran and Muslims later tell us exactly what he means, uh, you better have some very good evidence if you go against that. Now, Shabir, he says that in, in response to uh, whether God being deceptive, just keep in mind, he acknowledged that this is the dominant Muslim view. So according to the dominant, most popular Muslim view, Allah tricked and deceived people by making someone else look like Jesus on the cross. Uh, but then Shabir goes on to say, perhaps God allowed Jesus to appear to his followers to comfort them. Well, uh, that didn't have the impact that God wanted. Didn't Allah know that, that they're going to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead because that's what they concluded? Uh, let me go through some non-Christian scholars again on how certain it is that Jesus' followers became convinced that he rose from the dead. Gert Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Bart Ehrman, we can say with complete certainty that some of his disciples at some later time insisted that he soon appeared to them, convincing them that he had been raised from the dead. Bart Ehrman again, it is, his, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. So notice, again, they're not saying, hey, we have some good reason to think. We, we can say it's probably true. They're taking this as historical fact and historical, as historically certain, one, that Jesus died by crucifixion, and two, that his followers, his original followers, became convinced that he had appeared to them, risen from the dead. Now, according to the dominant view in Islam, where did Christians get the idea that Jesus died by crucifixion? We got it from Allah. We got it from Allah. So that would be Allah making us think something that's completely false. And according to Shabir, where did Jesus' followers get the idea that he had been raised from the dead? They got that idea from Allah, who allowed Jesus to appear to them knowing that they're going to conclude that he had appeared to them risen from the dead. He had appeared to them as the risen Lord. So where do, where do these doctrines come from? You can't blame the Apostle Paul, ladies and gentlemen. You can't blame the Council of Nicaea. This is Allah doing things that he has to know. He has to know that these things are going to corrupt Christianity. And so Shabir says, I, I lack critical thinking skills because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not being critical of these sources. Uh, well, that's not true. I'm pointing out what all of the sources have in common. All of the sources agree Jesus died by crucifixion. All of the sources agree that Jesus rose from the dead. All of the sources agree that Jesus is the Son of God. So here we're taking all of these sources that agree on these basic Christian doctrines, and I'm pointing out the fact that if all of these sources agree and they're all wrong then Jesus was a complete failure. His followers were complete failures. God tricked people 
And Christianity was corrupted and God couldn't do anything to stop it because he's part of the problem. He's part of the cause of the deception. So if you want to say all of this has been corrupted, uh, that's fine. But think about what you're saying about God and what you're saying about Jesus and what you're saying about the followers. It's not good, ladies and gentlemen, and this is Islam. Thank you, David. And we just got through our first rebuttal from each gentleman, each debater, and now we're going to give Shabir five minutes for your second rebuttal. We're getting the clock reset here. And we're getting close, and you can start right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, David uh, seems to be repeating many of the points which I've already answered, and it's interesting to have a debate going in this way because it almost sounds like you know a dialogue of the deaf, like we have to listen to each other, and if a point is already answered, we don't raise it again, unless you want to engage that uh, answer and then uh, look at a different aspect of it. Now, uh, David is saying that God is uh, deceptive in, in the, in, in the uh, following from the Islamic view, but uh, in, in order for him to be consistent, he has to make points against Islam that do not rebound on Christianity. For example, uh, what do we say about God being deceptive? The, the book of uh, Jeremiah uh, in the Bible says, uh, Yahweh has deceived me and uh, I was deceived. So that's the, the uh, Bible's prophet saying that God deceived the prophet himself. Uh, in the New Testament, it says that uh, God will send them strong delusion. So God sends delusions on people. Uh, and even a lying spirit, according to the Bible, God will send on, on, on people. Uh, so uh, is God being deceptive in the Bible too? So you, I mean, deal with your own source before you come to uh, deal with the Quran. But from the Quranic perspective, I wouldn't say that God was being deceptive here. God allows the flow of history of events and people uh, became deceived through that flow of, uh, of events. They, 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 those who uh, wanted by hook or crook to crucify Jesus, they were the ones who were deceived by the circumstances. They, they thought that they waited and witnessed Jesus dying on the cross. Uh, Jesus expired. Uh, the Sabbath was approaching. The Jews left to go and observe their Sabbath. And then later on they heard that, uh, that the body was taken down. They didn't expect that. So even on the Sabbath day, they violated the Sabbath rules to go into the court of Pilate uh, to say to him that you should seal up the tomb to make sure that Jesus doesn't get out. Otherwise, his followers may come steal his body and then tell people that he resurrected from the dead. And then the second deception will be worse than the first. So they felt that they were being deceived in this circumstance. Now, uh, it says that Pilate uh, ordered for the tomb to be sealed. Uh, and the soldiers went and they sealed the tomb, but it doesn't say they checked to see if the body was still in there. So the body could have gone missing even on the Friday night, and they're sealing a, a, an empty tomb. Nobody, nobody is said to have checked. So what we have is that in the final analysis, the story which was actually written to convince us that Jesus actually died from the, on the cross and resurrected from the dead does not convince us once we examine it with a critical eye. And uh, the best rendition of this is to say that God rescued Jesus and raised him to himself. Uh, uh, David is asking, well, what does the Messiah accomplish? It looks like he's a failed uh, Messiah in the, Christi in the Muslim view. Jesus failed. But, in fact, the Quran is supporting a, a victorious Messiah. If we follow the biblical thinking on this, the Gospels represent Jesus as the Messiah, son of David. If he was the Davidic Messiah, then he had to sit on the throne and rule instead of the Romans. He had to actually drive out uh, the Romans and seize power from them. But he never did that. Christians say, okay, when he comes back, he will do that. And the Jews are saying, okay, when he comes back and he does that, then we'll believe he's a true Messiah. But so far, it looks like he's the false Messiah. Because if he was to be the true Messiah, he had to sit on the throne. He didn't sit on the throne. He's a false Messiah. He hung on the cross instead. Christians say, but God vindicated him by raising him from the dead. But if, if to all appearances, he's the false Messiah, why would God raise him from the dead, thus vindicating him privately, whereas publicly to all of the Jews, God made him appear to be the false Messiah so that Jews can go away laughing, ha, 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 uh, we uh, crucified the, 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 the so-called Messiah. The Quran answers that by saying, Ma qataluhu ma They killed him not, nor did they crucify him. The Quran is actually defending him and saying, No, you guys did not succeed. You did not kill him. And in any case, uh, the, the Quran does not represent Jesus as the Davidic Messiah. So the Quran does not have this internal contradiction. That internal contradiction is there in the Gospels, which, when studied carefully, makes Jesus appear to be the false Messiah. Now, why do I not agree with all of these scholars when they say that Jesus definitely died by crucifixion? These uh, scholars are... Uh, I agree with them on, on, uh, from a historical point of view. This is what historians have to say. But they're starting with the assumption that Jesus did not rise from the dead. E.P. Sanders in his book, Paul, says, 
once we, we take into the, uh, consideration the idea that Jesus resurrected from the dead, we have to ask, how do we know he was dead in the first place? And that, that's the problem for Christianity. See, all these historical co scholars, whether Ludeman or Crossland, they're starting with the assumption Jesus was dead and buried, and perhaps his body was eaten by dogs, and that's the end of him. No resurrection from the dead. Be uh, disciples may have believed. Some of them, according uh, in your own words, Bart Herman said, some of them, not necessarily all of them, but they believe that's not necessarily true. So from that perspective, he died, buried, that's the end of him. From the Quranic and, and uh, Christian perspective, he, God raised him. Shabir, David, we have five minutes for your second rebuttal. All right, now, Shabir draws attention to deception uh, of God in the Bible as if this would be a, a parallel problem. But, I mean, if you actually read what, what Jeremiah is saying when he says, God, you deceived me, is he's convinced, based on God's promises, that God is going to rescue Israel. And then he finds out it's not happening. It's not happening. Israel is crumbling. And he says, God, you deceived me, right? Many Jews would have said the same thing. You, we, we thought we're going to be your people forever, and look what's happening to us. So not the same thing as God. God making people think that Jesus died by crucifixion and then making people think that he rose from the dead by allowing Jesus to appear to them as Shabir claimed. Now uh, at the, towards the end there Shabir was making a, an interesting point about the, about the Messiah and uh, how this is a problem for Christianity and, but not for Islam. This is actually a huge, massive problem for Islam just based on the word gospel, just based on the word Injil. Injil is a transliteration of the Greek term euangelion, right, which means good news. But in the first century, it had a particular meaning in its Jewish context. And in its Greek context, it's actually a technical term. In its Greek context, euangelion had two basic meanings. One, a new king had risen to power. So they would use this when a new Roman emperor took over because this is the king who's going to bring peace. And when a huge military victory had been won. So, for instance, if they conquered the barbarians, the good news that peace had been brought to the Roman Empire by this victory. In its Jewish context, it referred to God uh, returning to his throne or God returning, uh, bringing his people out of captivity. So this is the use of the good news, the gospel, the euangelion, the Injil. Now, notice how all of those different meanings fit the Christian view perfectly. They all fit the Christian view, right? Jesus wins this huge victory over sin and death. Jesus is the Davidic Messiah enthroned. He says, that, uh, that he, he, I mean, all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. Uh, he brings his people out of captivity by his sacrifice for their sins. And now, again, since he is the divine son of God, he is re when he returns, when he takes his throne, that is God becoming enthroned over Israel. So all of these meanings of the term in Geo fit the Christian doctrine perfectly. Guess what? They don't fit Islam at all. How are people being rescued from captivity by the Islamic view Th through what Jesus did, through what he brought? How are, what, what tremendous victory was won? Again, this is a military-like victory. What happened? What new king has been enthroned? None of this fits the Islamic view. And this goes back to the problem we've seen before. Uh, Allah just doesn't know what we mean by Son of God. Allah doesn't know what, what we mean when we say Trinity. Allah responds to all of these things, and even the very term that's used to describe the revelation Jesus brought doesn't make sense. Why? Because Allah doesn't know what it means. The author of the Quran has no clue what we mean by these basic things. And if, if, if the point isn't clear here, just imagine, uh, imagine my Muslim friends that someone comes along and he claims to be a prophet, and he says, uh, hey, I'm talking about the Quran, but the Quran is not something that means to, is to be recited ever. You must never recite the Quran. The Muslim response would be, what are you talking about? The word means recitation. How can it not be something that's meant to be recited? You would think that this prophet has no clue what he's talking about because he doesn't even understand the meaning of the word. That's how it is with Allah, with Allah coming and telling us, uh, yes, Jesus brought the Injil. Oh, okay, so he brought us this tremendous victory about a new king being enthroned, releasing his people from captivity, and the Lord returning to reign over his people. None of that fits Islam. So I conclude that the author of the Quran had no clue what he's talking about. 
Uh, so, if, and, and by the way, going back to the point about the deception, Shabir is saying, you know, God says that he can send people a delusion. Oh, of course, of course. That, that's true in Christianity and Islam. The difference is, in Islam, who's being led astray here? Who's being led astray by what Allah is doing when he makes people believe that Jesus died on the cross and then he lets Jesus appear to his followers? It's historical fact that Jesus' followers became convinced that he died on the cross for their sins and that he rose from the dead. That is a historical fact, according to scholars ac from across the theological spectrum. Where did they get those ideas? According to Islam. According to Islam, they got those ideas from Allah, so it's Jesus' followers who are becoming deceived by what Allah is doing. David, we'll let you start. All right, well, uh, the question before us is, was Jesus a prophet of Islam? According to our records, Q would be the exception. That's because Q was supposedly a sayings document. But everything that's actually giving us the, the history of Jesus, everything agrees Jesus died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead, that he is Lord, that he's the divine son of God. So this is what we find when we go to all of our sources. And if we consider the Islamic response, if we consider the Islamic response, well, we find that Allah is the one who convinced people that Jesus had died by crucifixion, by disguising someone according to the mainstream Muslim, Muslim view. Shabir is one of the few exceptions who says otherwise. Uh, but then we have that Allah deceives people into thinking, well, okay, he, he allowed people, he allowed Jesus to appear to his followers, but if Allah is all-knowing, he knows how this is going to be interpreted by Jesus' followers. They interpret it to, believe, to mean that Jesus has risen from the dead. So belief in Jesus' death and resurrection are from Allah. So the only other thing we have is uh, Jesus claimed to be divine as far as the core of the Christian gospel. So the core of the Christian gospel tells us that Jesus is Lord, that he's the son of God. And the Muslim response is, well, there's, there's massive corruption of text. Shabir wants to know what happened in these intervening years. Well, during that time, as any, as any uh, scholar of the first century can tell you, uh, oral tradition was, ha was respected more than a written document, right? You give you a written document versus someone who's there telling you what happened. The person telling you what happened is much more respectable. And so this is the time when Jesus' followers are going out preaching. They eventually would write, the, write it down in, it would be written down in texts. But during the time of the apostles, they're going to go out and preach. So what's happening during this time? The apostles are going out preaching. Their message is being carried on. And then that's the material that gets incorporated into the Gospels. If you say that by the time the Gospels are written, everything has been corrupted, what do you have? You are forced to say that these disciples were completely incompetent, that the, tr the, the true followers of Jesus who spread their message, that Allah just didn't protect it. The, follow the, the, the Christianity that eventually permeated the Roman Empire preached Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. Where do those doctrines come from? The death and resurrection, those come from Allah. The deity from someone else, according to Shabir. But it's everywhere. And that means that all of the work Jesus did, it just didn't lead anywhere. He picked followers. They didn't get anything done. They just couldn't defend the message. What is the point? And again, compare this with the Christian view. God is completely victorious. Jesus is completely victorious. Those followers carry that message to their bloody deaths, and refuse to back down. God is victorious from beginning to end. In the Islamic view, God does all these things, but can't protect it. Everything is corrupted. We need to wait six centuries for God to get something right. Uh, blasphemy. Okay, we, uh, we will reset the clock, and as soon as we do that, we'll allow Dr. Shabir Ali to give his three-minute uh, conclusion. And we are getting close, and you may start in just a couple seconds, and go right ahead. <laughs> Finally, folks, uh, as we come to the end of today's uh, debating, let's uh, draw together the strings of uh, ideas that have flowed during this uh, debate. Our first debate was about whether Jesus is the Son of God, and uh, the second debate, whether he was the, a prophet of Islam. And we have seen in the first debate many arguments to, think that, to show that Jesus was actually not the Son of God. He didn't claim to be the Son of God, but uh, gradually the belief developed in, in him as the Son of God, first metaphorically, and then later on by virgin birth, and then later on still by um, ontological uh, eternal generation 
from God. And eventually that led to the Council of Nicaea, in which was declared that Jesus is the very God of very God. And uh, that is how it survives in Christianity, though it's a very difficult concept to explain. And the Quran draws us back to the original teaching that Jesus was a servant and messenger of God. And that led us to the second debate, uh, which was on whether Jesus was a prophet of God. And in fact, we see that even in the, in the Bible, there are many indications that Jesus was a prophet of God. He, he continued to preach that, and this is how he was regarded. Even in the last of all of the four Gospels, the most developed of them, the Gospel according to John, Jesus was regarded as a uh, prophet. So uh, the Islamic uh, revelation is actually restating the earliest uh, belief that was uh, known about Jesus. He was a prophet. And moreover, it is clear that Jesus was teaching monotheism in the Gospel. He bowed down and prayed. He fell on his face, according to Matthew's gospel, and uh, prayed to God. So he was obviously not the God he was praying to. He was obviously a prophet calling people to worship that one God. But his call was later on modified, where Jesus, in Mark's gospel, for example, clearly declared the monotheistic formula, the Shema Yisrael. It was later on dropped from Matthew's retelling of the same story, where Jesus was shown to be uh, lacking of, in knowledge in, in Mark's gospel. Uh, the story is rewritten so that he's no longer lacking in knowledge in the later gospels. In fact, he starts to know the secrets, the secret thoughts of, of people around him. Uh, so there's a development in the story. Similar to with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the story is later on One written and rewritten in order to convince us that Jesus rose from the dead. But once we go back to it with a critical eye, we see the loopholes and realize that, for example, nobody checked to see if his body was still in the tomb. And perhaps his body has already been raised to heaven uh, if we take the Muslim belief. Uh, now, if we go to the Christian uh, belief, uh, then there's no reason actually for thinking uh, that uh, Jesus really raised, uh, was raised from the dead because the Christian thinking uh, depends on God wanting to vindicate Jesus. But since, to all appearances, Jesus already appeared to be the false Messiah, not by a reinterpretation. Later on, Christians will say, okay, gospel means this, and therefore Jesus still fulfilled the requirement of preaching the good news. Uh, but uh, going by the uh, initial expectation that he should rule on the throne of David, he didn't so rule temporarily. Therefore, he appeared to be the false Messiah. It is only Islam that rescues belief in him and makes it possible to believe that Jesus was a prophet and the true Messiah of God. Thank you. Thank you, John.